When I booked The Vampire Diaries, one of the first things I did was delete my Facebook. There was nothing too scandalous to see, but just enough late night cigarettes or drunk face photos presented themselves as easy targets for creating a narrative that I wanted to stay far away from, that I was a party girl. And while the photographic diary of my youth 100% depicted the life of just that, a young LA party girl living somewhere between finding herself and losing herself, I knew that booking the show was the opportunity of a lifetime and I didn't want to blow it by publicly appearing irresponsible or unprofessional. I decided I'd take the chance to control the narrative of how I was seen in the digital world. And at the time, I could. It was early 2009, Twitter was just beginning to chirp, but Instagram had yet to exist. So with one easy delete, I had the chance to throw my youth in the trash and start anew. I had the chance to learn from my experiences instead of be haunted by them. I had the chance to turn a new page, to ask myself how I saw myself instead of basing my identity off of what others thought of me. Free social media was such a sweet time. Sorry, Gen Z. <laughs> they say that life is about choices. While this may be true, I'd also like to add that life is about chances. I had the chance to be young and make irresponsible choices that everybody makes when their frontal lobes aren't fully formed yet. Like with boys and experimenting with drugs and using tanning beds and wearing side swooped bangs. I am really grateful for the chance of not having any of those things define who I am today. Would you like your boss to have photos and videos of all the things you were doing when you were 21 years old? Yeah, I didn't think so. At the age of 20, Amanda Knox made a handful of choices. While attending Seattle College, she chose to participate in a student exchange program. Amanda chose Perugia, Italy, where she would stay with three other young female exchange students from around the world. And while matters of the heart often feel they come without choice, Amanda did make the choice to call her new Italian boyfriend, Raffaele Solicito, after she discovered blood on the bathroom floor and feces left in the toilet of her shared flat on November 1st, 2007, because she felt suddenly suspicious that something really bad had happened. Now, if you continue down the rest of events of the hours, days, weeks, and years ahead, they will leave you asking, what are the chances? If you don't know who Amanda Knox is, you can easily take a moment and Google her because yeah, you can Google her because she is someone you can Google or watch the documentaries made about her trial or read her book or even listen to the hours and hours and hours of podcasts dedicated to trying to decipher who Amanda Knox really is or how the prosecution for the murder trial of Meredith Kircher got it so wrong. While some may consider Amanda to be the famous Amanda Knox, who made international headlines and spent four years in an Italian prison following her wrongful conviction of the 2007 murder of Meredith Kircher. Others still consider her to be the infamous Foxy Noxy, painted by the international media as some orgy-loving, drug-fueled, manipulative, cold-blooded murderer. The world seems to think they have a better idea of who Amanda Knox is than Amanda Knox. Because truth be told, the caricature of Amanda Knox is more known than Amanda. Today, my intentions are to just sit down with Amanda. Amanda is a mother, an exoneree, and author of the New York Times best-selling memoir, Waiting to be Heard. Between 2007 and 2015, Amanda spent nearly four years in an Italian prison and eight years on trial for a murder she did not commit. As an exoneree, she's become an advocate for criminal justice reform and media ethics. 
She also sits on the board of the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. Amanda Knox and her husband, Christopher Robinson, currently both host and produce their podcast, Labyrinths, which you can listen to anywhere you listen to podcasts. Amanda speaks often about struggling for the chance to put her wrongful conviction behind her. Before we jump into this interview, I want to take a minute to send my condolences to the Kircher family. And in case you, the listener, are wondering where I stand on the whole who done it of this true crime, I stand with the facts. The fact is that the bloody fingerprints of Rudy Gaudet were found in the victim's bedroom, and his DNA was found on both Meredith's clothes and on her body. Now, you don't hear about him often, but he's been recently released from prison after completing 13 of his 16-year sentence for good behavior. What are the chances? And I was like, no, 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 hold on. I need an epidural. And they're like, oh, she's coming out of you now. And I was like, nope, I can hold it. I oh just my give God. me a minute. I can hold her in. I can do this. Uh, but there is, it is a unique experience because you also then were the same. You weren't like going into 2020 being like, OK, the world is shut down. I think this is a good time where we're home to like try for a baby because I did have friends who did that. Hmm, um, interesting. Where I, same. Yep. Because I was a, also I think your experience where I was like, oh, wow, I'm pregnant and now we're in a global pandemic. <laughs> this is a twist. Yeah. I mean, so the way that it worked out timing wise for me is my husband and I were planning on trying to start a family as soon as we got married. And we happened to have gotten married on February 29th, 2020. So we really like flew in under the radar before the world completely locked down like a week or two later. So we did get to celebrate our wedding. Um, we did not get to go on our honeymoon. We had to argue with quite a few airlines in order to get reimbursed for those tickets that we bought. And um, and we started, we had a moment of doubt, like, is what's happening to the world? Is the world falling apart? What are we doing? Um, but we decided to go ahead with our plans anyway, because um, there's no time is the perfect time to have a baby. You just gonna have to commit to whatever that is going to bring into your life is the way that we looked at it. Yeah, no, that's what I tell all of my friends. It's like, yes, there are better times than others. You know, <laughs> global pandemic, interesting time to have a baby. Um, but uh, but there's never really a perfect time for that. You just kind of got to jump into the deep end and be like, oh, I get to learn how to swim now. This will yep. this will be interesting. Jumping right in, I one of my questions that I had for you was uh, my the whole way I got into podcasting and even listening to podcasts is I was of, you know, I was one of the sheep. I was one of the masses that listened to Serial back mm. in the day and was like, oh, I'm, what is this old timey radio thing on my phone? <laughs> um, and I was just addicted. And so one of my questions was going to be, you know, did you listen to Serial at the time and the Adnan Syed case? And and then that just happened to coincide with, you know, Monday's big monumental news that he's been released. Did you follow that case? Have you followed it more recently um, as an exoneree and in your philanthropic efforts within being an exoneree? Yeah, I was one of the masses that was completely sucked in uh, by the Serial a whole thing about uh, Adnan's case. I was impressed with their reporting and that I I always come into any true crime podcast or documentary series with a bit of trepidation because I have seen the good, the bad and the ugly when it comes to true crime. I've experienced all of them personally, and I always wish the very best for anyone who is having the worst experience of their life depicted as an entertainment product for the masses. Um, I do think that they are they sort of followed the tradition of the thin blue line, for example, that led to a reevaluation of what was considered just this cut and dry you know, sweep it under the carpet kind of case. Same thing when it came to the West Memphis Three and the documentaries about that case. Um, so I followed it closely. I thought they did a great job. Um, and it's extremely exciting to, like when I heard the news that Adnan was, 
the conviction had been overturned. So I think what's interesting in this case is that the reason he was released, the reason why his conviction was overturned was due to a Brady violation. Are you familiar with what a Brady violation is? No. Okay, so a Brady violation means that initially when he was being investigated and tried for the murder of his girlfriend, um, the police and the investigators and the prosecutors had evidence that was favorable to him that they did not give to his defense team. And that favorable evidence was some very serious other suspects that could have committed this crime and had motive, like one person had actually threatened the victim's life at one point. And so the fact that the prosecution had this evidence but did not give it to the defense in making their defense at trial was what's called a Brady violation. Um, They did not have exculpatory evidence that would have helped facilitate his defense at trial. And indeed, one of the major things that Adnan's defense team was trying to do at trial was point to the fact that there are other people who could potentially have committed this crime instead of the way the prosecution presented it, which was that only Adnan had reason and ability to have committed this crime. So what's fascinating about this case is generally when you see a Brady violation, it's usually a defense team that comes in and fights tooth and nail to get it proven that there was evidence that was not released to them um, or released to the defense team during the investigation and trial phase. What's fascinating in this case is that the prosecutors have come forward and said, hey, here's like they're not the same prosecutors that prosecuted the case back then. But new prosecutors came in and said, hey, there was all this like exculpatory evidence that was not presented to the defense. So we, the prosecutors, are asking for him to be released, for his conviction to be overturned. That's what's super interesting and unique about this case is you don't typically see prosecutors coming forward to overturn convictions. Can the prosecution basically, like, be sued? Are they liable for anything at this point? Or would it just be like, whoops, we, we we came through and did the right thing at the end. So the way that that works is prosecutors have um, professional immunity. So each individual prosecutor cannot be sued for what is actually a, a violation of someone's rights. Who ends up getting sued in these cases, say Adnan were to take this um, as a sort of civil suit against the people who did this to him, it would be a suit against the state that convicted him in the first place. So the prosecution that is representative of the state, they are empowered by the state. They are the ones who are then ultimately going to be answerable to his years of wrongful imprisonment. Mm. Um, But again, all of that really, really depends upon the state and the statutes of the state, because some states make it easier for people to file those kinds of civil suits to claim, you know, wrongful imprisonment and to get compensation for that time. Other states make it extremely difficult. So again, it's it's we'll see how this all pans out. But my my hope is for the best for Adnan. Man, I am impressed that you are able to to, you know, jump on the serial bandwagon all these you know years ago, also going through what you were going through at that time. Uh, I rewatched uh, the Netflix documentary that you participated in. I know your name very, very well from following your story. But I 100 percent have to admit, I know your name because of the way it was sensationalized within the news. I was very much following it as entertainment trial by media. You know, that is what I knew. And I've been reading more about you. I've been reading a lot of the pieces that you've written and listening to you on countless interviews. And it's just been such a delight to get to know you through Aww. that uh, gaze and also realizing that you and I are only like two months apart. We are the same <laughs> age. <laughs> Yeah. And then, too, but like for some reason, you just seemed like such an adult at that time. And now I'm like, fuck, we were the same age living very, very different lives. It's easy to think back and 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 kind of assume that 
you were released from, you know, four years of wrongful conviction from the Italian prison. Uh, and I love later on, you would tweet back at Lady Gaga when she's like, oh, fame is prison. And you're like, no, prison is prison. Uh, obviously going through what I would assume to be one of life's most traumatic experiences and the assumption that once you get to go home, you just get to go home and start your life again. But that's kind of where I would appreciate the opportunity to pick up with you. You know, at that point, how old were you and what was that flight home like and how at that very young, impressionable age? I mean, I'm really gripping on at the age of 35 that uh, realizing and forgiving my young self that at the age of 25, our frontal lobes weren't fully formed yet. Yeah, <laughs> at all. And uh, so anything that kind of happened pre-25, I'm like, oh, we're going to give grace to that uh, child version <laughs> of myself. Um, but what you were up against, you know, how how do you go home after that? That's a great question. And I will answer it at, in just a moment. I wanted to say one thing on Lady Gaga, which is <laughs> um, I I wanted to like have a little poke fun moment at Lady Gaga, also in part because she was really blowing up um, while I was in prison. So I remember very dis so in prison, there were like Every um, actually every cell had a, a TV. Um, it was one of the things that we had available to us. And it had like eight channels on it. And the most popular channel was the MTV channel. So you got a lot of I, I, I heard a lot of Lady Gaga <laughs> while I was in prison. <laughs> and I just like it just when like she was like fame is prison. I was like, I had you ringing like go, your songs <laughs> over and over in my head actually in prison <laughs> you're like listen um, poker face listen Steph. like <laughs> so it was just like a fun little like nudge um yeah Wait, was so this also was during like the height of jersey shore was that the other thing that was on at all times um so i don't so italian mtv was a slightly different than okay. um than what was happening here in the u.s i totally missed jersey shore i have no idea what Jersey Shore is or what it's all about. I think about. that's okay. I yeah. think it's okay. I feel <laughs> slightly behind in life because I know way too much about Jersey Shore. Um, but I love that Lady Gaga just like kept you, was just there at all times. And uh, <laughs> yes. I just loved that tweet exchange so much. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was thinking when I was sending that <laughs> it's tweet fair. out into the universe. It's fair. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the other sort of sad thing about that is I I actually have a huge sense of humor. I love to laugh. I love comedy. And so I like to to poke fun in a playful and, you know, benevolent way. Um, and my only regret is that people tend to associate me with just very serious and sad and tragic things. And so when I make a tweet that is meant to be a joke, people take it very seriously and tragically. Um, so I had a lot of Lady Gaga fans who were not uh, happy with me, I must say. Anyway. <laughs> the little monster claws come out. I've seen her in concert and she goes like, claws up. And uh, so, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. So the flight home. Um, the flight home. So I had just spent my early 20s in prison. I had been living the first two years of my imprisonment. I was convinced that this was all just a really big mis misunderstanding and that I was going to go home. I was just in this weird limbo space where I was living a life that I shouldn't have been living. I was, I almost felt like I was living someone else's life. Like I was standing in for the actual person who had committed this crime. And I was waiting for all the adults in the room to figure out that I wasn't supposed to be there. And when my conviction came down and I was sentenced to 26 years in prison. I had a huge uh, reevaluation of what my situation was. Um, and also I had to rethink what my life even was. Like I thought that I was just waiting to go back to the life that I should have been living. And suddenly it became very clear to me that this was my life, that my life was limited to these 
concrete walls and to this this environment of deprivation and um, institutionalized suffering. And it it took a second for me to really reevaluate what that meant for me and what it meant to live a good life under those circumstances. But I spent a lot of time thinking about that in the latter two years of my imprisonment. So when I was released, I almost was sort of on that plane ride home. First of all, it was incredibly surreal. Like I I was not even used to looking out the window and seeing anything but what I would see out of my cell. Like the prison van, for instance, the prison van that took me from prison to the courthouse, it had no windows. So the only, I had very, very limited views even of the world outside of the courthouse and the prison. And so suddenly I'm in all these cars that have windows that I can just look outside and we're driving by an elementary school and I can hear children laughing. And like all of those just casual details about that we take for granted in everyday life, like, oh, the ground has grass on it, or, oh, there are people walking around. Like I had been completely removed from that world. So going back into it very suddenly and with an entire world chasing me down, like there were, you know, journalists who were on the plane um, as I was trying to go home. We had people chasing us in cars um, like it was one. It would have been a rush for anyone, no matter what. But it was a tremendous rush for me because suddenly I was exposed to the world again and I was a raw nerve. Um, everything. I was just so sensitive to everything. And even just being around my family members, like suddenly yeah. I'm in the backseat of a car with my mom and we're, you know, driving down these dirt roads in the middle of, you know, the Italian countryside, booking it to the the airport. And like my mom is just holding me and clutching me and crying. And we're just with each other. And I I hadn't been able to be that close to my mother for that long. So being on that airplane, um, I was hyped up and I have felt a little bit like Alice in Wonderland. Like, is this a Am I like a part of me wondered if I was actually losing my mind and I was dreaming everything. I was having an extremely vivid dream. I obviously realized that that's not the case, but like a part of me felt that a part of me felt like this can't be real. Like it's it's too good to be true. This can't be real. And I was afraid to go to sleep um, for like a good week. I I I. First of all, I was pumped up with adrenaline, but I also was afraid to go back to sleep in case I woke up in prison again. So I was awake. I was watching my mom sleep on the plane. I watched as we like came down and touched down in Seattle, recognizing the this incredible Pacific Northwest landscape that we have here that's just gorgeous even from the air and walking out of the plane and smelling the smell of grass and the smell of rain and the smell of home after four years was one of the most vivid sensory experiences of my life. But then, of course, I was immediately stuck in front of a press conference and I had to say words to people with cameras. And there was a whole crowd of people who were holding up signs saying, welcome home, Amanda. And I went from being in utter isolation, completely deprived from the world to introduced reback into a world that was incredibly heightened in a sensory way, but also heightened in a personal way. Suddenly I was personally available and exposed to not just the people in my life, but the people who had absorbed my story and the case from, from afar. And it, a part of me thought for a moment that I was actually finally getting to go back to the life that I should have been living. I sort of flipped back into that mindset, like, oh my God, is this really happening? Am I getting to go back to being myself again? And 
But very quickly, as I came home and there were paparazzi staking outside of my house, and for months later, I couldn't go outside of my house without people recognizing me, following me, I realized that the life that I thought that I would get to go back home to didn't actually exist anymore. And that was a sort of devastating blow. But the other thing that I discovered is that I wasn't the same person. Yeah. So it wouldn't even make sense for me to go back to the life that I had before. Pretty significant experience in your life that not everyone would know how to go through, let alone has gone through. I think the interesting thing about any form of trauma or grief is that when you're in it, it's so easy to just, you're kind of in survival mode of it until all of a sudden when someone goes, it's over now. And then all of a sudden you're stuck feeling all of the feelings because mm. you're not just trying to keep your head off up above the water anymore. Your feet are firmly on the ground. And I think that we assume that's when everything's better, but I feel like that's when all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, this is a whole, I'm just in a whole new chapter of it now. Now is when a whole other level of the work begins, which usually yeah. revolves around healing and really reflecting on what the hell just happened. Yeah. And, um, and also you be, you became a character to so many people. It became, you know, I mean, if just going into another kind of uh, fun phenomenon was like the book Gone Girl, kind of loosely based, taken from a lot of headline stories and even if you watch the film, it's like you see it very easily. Like there's the performance of the the lead character, but you, even though it was your real life, you would become a character. This would become a story to people, and they, the expectation of oh, now we get to see what happens next and how this plays out was just abruptly thrown onto your shoulders. Earlier, you mentioned how at 35, you're you're finally giving your 20 to 25 year old self, um, some grace and some acknowledgement of like, oh, wow, they say you're an adult at 18, but you're really, you're yeah, in this no. very weird in between child adult stage. And it's like, I think we, we want adults, we want to be forgiving of those years because we've been there, right? We've all been there. We've, and we look now, like I have a younger sister who is in that age right now. And so I look at her and I'm like, oh man, what an, you know, what an amazing age to be in where you are learning what kind of person you really are. Um, and you're making all of the mistakes along the way. And I think what's interesting is that I did not get that same amount of grace and understanding from the adults in the world when I was that age. And when I came home from prison, I was 25 years old and I was being told and treated like I was the reason why this horrible bad thing had happened to me. That even if I was innocent and I had nothing to do with this crime, I was weird and I was to blame for what happened to me. So I internalized a lot of self-blame and a lot of self-hatred, honestly, um, because I was being told by the entire world that I was a freak, that I was a slut, that I was a psychopath, that I was... I was an idiot. I was a coward. I, um, that everything was my fault. And, um, and that I wasn't like other people. I, I was someone who fit into a neat little true crime box and woe to me if I ever dared to reach outside of it and try to be something beyond the story that was made up about me. At various times, I um, was told to disappear. Um, I was, 
I would, you know, people threatened my life on a regular basis and talked about how they were going to, you know, torture me to death in broad daylight before, you know, it, things like what I realized um, on the one hand was that a lot of the hatred that was being directed towards me was not personal because the person that these people hated didn't actually exist. Foxy Noxy, this like character that yeah. was a part of this morality tale that was being told on the international, you know, tabloid scale was a character and it was not real and it was not me. It just happened to have my face and my name. And so a lot of the hatred I received, I recognized as being not personal to me at all, but personal to whoever it was who was who felt that hatred towards that character and what they had inside of them. They were projecting that onto me. But at the same time, I internalized in a big way the idea that I was isolated from other people that I um, I didn't belong to humanity in the way that the rest of us belong to humanity. And it was a long time before I found little touchstones in the world that brought me back to a place of, of feeling like I belonged um, and feeling like that I had agency in my own life. You talk about like that trauma, you know, this is something I see a lot in the people that I, um, I interview for Labyrinths, um, which is my podcast. Um, I interview lots of people about the times in their lives that they felt most lost and how they found their way again. And what's interesting is I find that a lot of people tell the story of like, oh my gosh, this is how I got lost and this is how I got found again. But a lot of times people are actually feel the most lost after they survived something. Because mm -hmm. like you said, when you're in survival mode, things are actually quite clear. And that it's similar with me, right? Like I'm in prison, I'm on trial. I know that the A to B in this situation is prove my innocence and try not to get murdered in prison. It's that simple. Like simple, it's actually simple to do list of the it's day. It's a That's simple it. to do list. Two There's boxes not to much check. else. <laughs> yep. like, Listen like, to a lady, a little Lady Gaga, and uh, yes. you know, and, and then and go to like, sleep and do it again and stay sane. Like it's really <sighs> that simple. It's going back into the free world as not a free person that is more complicated, and that's when I encountered um, a lot of deep ongoing trauma and also processing of trauma that has only really resolved itself recently, you know, like 15 years after this took place, I'm finally feeling like I kind of have a handle on what happened to me and I'm no longer being re-traumatized by it on a daily basis. Um, Which I think a part of that is, is like, and not to gender it, but I think there is an element of like, especially women becoming like turning into their 30s. I think, you know, even motherhood is a big, you know, shift for anyone that decides to become a parent. But what I'm so impressed by you is that you still continued to walk through your life. I mean, you would become, you know, regardless of whether you liked it or not, you were a celebrity beyond just a local celebrity. You had people following you, wanting to capture your next moves. And there are people now, I mean, Taylor Swift went into hiding for a year. She was, you know, being lugged around in suitcases, allegedly. And a lot of people just kind of disappear for a while. And so the fact that you were able to continue to even if you didn't know what the next direction of your life where that was going to go it's very impressive that you were able to even take those next steps did you have a moment where you were like where you thought about disappearing or were you like fuck how am I going to make money now like what do I do now beyond mm. writing a book like what is what is your career now you know in in anyone that becomes infamous I mean I always think back, I, I look, I have an obsession with like very weird, obscure reality shows because I used to just watch all of them. Um, also, you know, going back to Jersey Shore. But uh, I just remember seeing like after Monica Lewinsky, which is a whole different, you know, a whole different ball game. But she became infamous 
and in famous in a way. And she became like the host of a reality love show about men wearing masks, like vying for the love of it was like called like Man in the Iron Mask or something. But huh. like that's what she decided to take at the time because she needed the money. It's like you don't think about what happens next, where at a certain point, you need to be able to apply for a job, you know, mm. travel, like go on dates, make a friend. <laughs> how do you how do you make a friend? Like, hey, 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 gal, y you know, you want to go for a hike and grab coffee sometime? Like, where are you from? What what happens when you do try to just beyond, you know, take your name back, but just kind of the the monotony, like little things in life, like how do you even push go on that again? Mm, that's a great question. Um, and it was complicated for me in the first four years of my release from prison because I was technically still on trial. I was tried again and convicted again of the same crime. And it wasn't until 2015 that I was definitively exonerated. So I spent another four years after my release from prison in this, again, limbo space, not knowing if I was just going to be ripped away from everything again and extradited back to Italy. But you're right. Like there there's absolutely the need to survive and be a person. And my first impulse after writing my memoir was um, to go back to school because it was a thing that I knew and I and I, it was really important to me to finish. But honestly, it was also like a safe place. It was the place that I knew. Being an adult in the world was a completely foreign idea to me. And it was very scary because I didn't, again, I felt like I didn't have the opportunity to encounter life as a normal person. I, I was not allowed. So I couldn't just go and get a job at a company because I come with a lot of publicity baggage. And the kinds of I know this um, Monica and I are we know each other and we've chatted a little bit about this. And one of the one of the big issues is even if people want to hire you, do they want to hire you for you or do they want to hire you for your name recognition and for the controversy that comes with it? Like people were, th you know, somebody reached out to me and was like, hey, I'll pay you $20,000 to be in a porno. And it's like the only reason that that person reached out to me was because I was accused of a heinous sex crime. So great. Like what e what is even my perceived value as a human being? It's as a caricature. It's as a cultural, like an ugly cultural reference point, not as a human being. And it did make it complicated for me to meet people and relate to them in a normal way. Those first years um, when I was still on trial, I did not make friends. I didn't trust anyone. And I spent a lot of time just either alone or hanging out with people who I knew from before Italy. And I was close to those people, but I also just didn't have a lot of people in my life. I had very, very few people. And it was very, very rare that I encountered somebody on the outside who didn't know me before, who I felt like, one, I could trust in the first place, but two, that could connect with me on a deep, in a deep way. An example, though, was there was a girl in one of my classes at college who didn't recognize me in class. I just introduced myself as Amanda. She introduced herself as herself. We, we sort of enjoyed each other's commentary and company in class. So we started meeting outside of class. And one day she came into the cafe that we normally, you know, hung out at and just read books together. And she like sat down next to me like plop. Oh my God, you're Amanda Knox. And my heart sank. I was like, fuck, did I just lose a friend? And she could see it on my face. I didn't say anything. But she immediately was like, no, 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 don't misunderstand me. I was raped when I was a teenager. And everything that you're sort of like talking about in your poetry in this obscure way, all these feelings of like helplessness and and having no control of your life and shame and and fear, all of that 
feels exactly like what I felt when I was raped as a teenager. And that moment sparked for me this realization that I was not as alone as I thought I was. And even though I had been through this incredibly unique experience, I belonged to people. I just didn't know who I belonged to. That led me to have other encounters. Like when I first met another wrongfully convicted person, it was kind of against my will. Um, I didn't like the idea that my life was being defined as the girl who was accused of murder. And I didn't really want to immerse myself in the world of people who were accused of murder because I it just it didn't feel like it belonged to me. It didn't feel like my story. It yeah, was something it's not like a great little tagline or like it doesn't really go well on a business card. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> resonate. And it was this thing that happened to me. It yes. was not something that I did. And yes. so meeting other people in that world almost felt like I was accepting it in a way that I just didn't want to. But my mom really insisted that it would be helpful for me to talk to people who would understand exactly what I had been through. She convinced me and drove me to this um, annual conference where all of these different, you know, exonerees and wrongfully convicted people gather. And it was when I was there, um, my mom sort of like pushed me in and was like, good luck. <laughs> and um, and such a um, mom thing, to such do. a mom <laughs> thing. I love her. No, I mean, she was more sensitive than that, but she was pushing me to be there. And as soon as I walked in those doors, I was immediately embraced by these two men who had each spent over a decade each in prison for crimes that they didn't commit. And they both the, the, I remember the, I will never forget the first thing they said to me. It was. You don't have to worry about a thing, little sister, we know. And all of my fear and anxiety around being in a room full of strangers who would recognize me disappeared. Like they knew that like my entire adult life was spent either in isolation or constantly explaining myself. And here was a space that I did not have to do that for like the first time ever. And it it was such a feeling of joy and relief and surprise because here I was like in a room full of mostly men, mostly men who had spent at least a decade in prison, men who came from very different circumstances than me. I'm like, you know, kid who grew up in the suburbs, who went to college, like a lot of these guys were from poor backgrounds. Um, they they were a lot more isolated in their youth. And they that's why they were easy targets for wrongful conviction. They were poor. They didn't have family support that that you would have wanted or their families just couldn't support them because it was the criminal justice system is exceedingly expensive and fighting for your innocence is you can bankrupt entire communities trying to defend a single person. So it's um, it was astonishing to me to realize once again that I belonged to people who I didn't even know I belonged to. And that set me up on this journey of like making my own meaning out of what happened to me and and putting that meaning like projecting that meaning forward, saying, OK, if I know that this means this to me, what can I then make of that that is going to be an expression of my best self and my best intentions? Do you feel like them seeing you gave you permission to see yourself for the first time in a long time and then also inspired you to want to make sure that you can go out in the world so others who might have experienced just even a sliver of the pain you did that you could go, no, I see you too. And we all see each other. Yes. To feel seen and recognized and understood. Like there's nothing more cruel and oh, there, there's lots of things that are more cruel and brutal. But one of those like deeply ironically cruel things is having your flit, your face like splattered across Times Square and feeling like nobody sees you. And I've had that happen. I've I've been on front page after front page after front page and everyone thought that they knew who I was. And it felt like no matter what I did, no matter what I said or what I did, I was always going to be viewed through 
a lens that was preconceived. I was prejudged before anyone ever knew me. And so it felt like nothing that I would ever do or say would ever matter. And being in groups of people and meeting other people who genuinely saw me gave me the hope to be able to be a person who can define themselves, but also to recognize that like, if I see someone else and I recognize them and I give them the courtesy of just human to human acknowledgement, how life changing that can be. I try to go out of my way to do that in my work, in my personal life. And it's deeply, deeply fulfilling. It's one of those silver linings to tragedy where you find like in, in all of that pain, there is purpose, there is need. And your own needs are not just your own, those are universal needs. So finding opportunities to see how you can fulfill your own needs and someone else's at the same time is amazing. It almost sounds like you were able to exhale for the first time in a long, long time. Has there been a day, or I'm sure that there has, I hope that there has, but was there a singular day that comes to mind where, you know, you woke up, maybe grab some coffee or whatever you drink in the morning, um, then you had to go run some errands, but then maybe you had to get gas because you forgot to get gas before you ran the errands. And then you got everything done and then you went home and then you realized you need to get some food. You ate some dinner, maybe had a glass of wine, watched some TV. And as you were going to bed went, wow, I just, I just lived my life today and I didn't feel the weight of everything that I've been through hmm. for, for one day. Well, going back to the whole motherhood discussion, um, just one of the things that I love about being a mom and I'm, uh, I work from home and I am the primary caregiver to our child, being present with her and having permission to be as silly and, and ridiculous and childlike as I possibly can be to relate to her on her level is one of the most freeing experiences. Um, it's one thing I love about my husband is that he he embraces my silliness. I'm a very silly person at heart, and I love just having fun and cracking jokes and being playful and putting on costumes or you know trying on weird voices while we're making coffee or you know like all of these. Just uh, like oh, silly, I, I read all about things. and listened about your uh, proposal <laughs> and wedding, and so yes, I it really I was like, okay, there is a person for everyone in the world. There uh, is. It is. <laughs> Yeah, so it is a unique extra experience. With yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so being silly with her is and just being present with her. That's the thing that's so beautiful about children is that they're not living in the past, they're not living in the future. They're living right now, which really is the only thing that exists. And so if you're going to fill your present with, you know, the intrusive, invading terror thoughts of what happened to you in the past or the intrusive terror thoughts about what will happen to you in the future, you're losing the only thing that really exists, which is right now. And there is always, always, always a best thing that you can do right now. And sometimes it's just making silly faces at your kid. And that is actually literally the best thing that you can do right now. And that is the only thing that exists. And then it's the only thing that matters. It's amazing. My friends and I talk about it all the time, the fear that goes into having kids. Mm. And then even if you have one, the fear of like, do I have another one? What does that mean? Did you always want kids? Let's just start there. Did you always want kids when, even when you were little? Yes. Um, I think my mom made me sign a contract when I was around <laughs> 10 years old, promising not to have kids before 30. She me like too. had me what like is that? write it out in crayon <laughs> and sign it. <laughs> Same thing. She except she wanted me to wait till I was like 30 to get married and then have kids. But then she was also like, but there's also a ticking time clock. So you can't wait too long. I was like, well, this is a panic. I feel like there's like something about 1987 children that like had this like 
girls, go out into the world and, and work and be independent. But also, if you want babies, you got to have them soon, but not new, too soon. But make your own money. But then also have a traditional fit. Yeah, it's all yeah. that. All that stuff. I mean, what were your feelings having a child knowing? Look, I was on a TV show that I love. My, when I say like dumb, it's like comparatively to my representation and any sort of like press or the world or, you know, my version of being in entertainment is very different than the way that you were sensationalized as entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew like having kids and going out into the world, you know, I explained to my six year old that I was on a TV show and people stop and they want to talk to me and they want to talk to her. And, and I'm very kind of guarded when I'm with my kids. Yeah. And I have a lot of rules for when I'm with my kids for myself on how I kind of set those healthy boundaries as far as, you know, how I'm recognized in public and, you know, kind of keeping them by me and keeping them safe. Were you already thinking about these things before you even had a child, given how, you know, you've already been so under the public scrutiny? The way that I've articulated that to myself is I have felt like I myself am living in the shadow of the worst experience of my life. And the last thing that I wanted for my daughter was to feel like she was living in the shadow of the worst experience of my life. And what do you do about that? Well, I feel like the only thing that we can do as parents is model perspectives and behavior. And if I can show my daughter that I am not trapped by what happened to me and that I have agency in my own life and I do not live under the shadow of the worst experience of my life, that I have my own light and my own story, what I hope is that she will recognize that in herself as well and will practice her own agency and her own life and presence. Um, so I think that, again, yeah, as long as I'm modeling that behavior and encouraging her in whatever direction she wants to take herself and her life, like I'm not actually, I, I'm, at, I'm really weirdly at peace with it. I feel like I know how to be there for her. And again, one of those insane gratitude moments, silver linings, like I have no doubt, given everything that I've gone through, that whatever it may be that could possibly happen to my daughter in her life, I know how to be there for her. And what a freaking gift, because I don't, I could not say that before this happened to me. So in, in a way, it's one of those flipping those things around. Is this a thing that happened to you or is it a thing that happened for you? Like, how do you turn what happened to you into something that happens for you? And one of those ways for me is it's like, I just know what trauma is. I know what it is to lose yourself and be have your own life be stolen from you and your own sense of identity and purpose and meaning and potential. Like I know what that feels like so deep down. And so I know how to be there for her when it comes to be her turn and something happens because something always happens to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh... I, I've talked a lot about that with other friends and just on this microphone of, you know, do we all just think we've been bamboozled? Like, you know, it just feels like when bad things happen in life and it's no, it's it's you know, it's not why did this happen to me? It's why not? Why wouldn't this happen to me? Bad, bad things happen. That that happens. Mm -hmm. You can't. That's just not how life works where you just walk through it and everything's fine. There's obviously very different degrees of that <laughs> <laughs> totally but yeah. everyone has something like that's the thing yeah. is it's like if we and that's what one of those things that makes me really sad about um, what's going on with teenage girls struggling with depression now because they're given this impression from social media that everyone else's lives are awesome and they're not dealing with their own thing and and they feel like they have to perform themselves or the best versions of themselves before they even know what the best version of themselves is. And they don't know how to 
find strength in their own vulnerabilities. Like I get why people are, are feeling lost and confused before they've even had a chance. Like one of the things about being young is not knowing who you are yet. And the pressure to perform being a person, especially on young girls now is something I think about a lot, just in terms of now being a mother of a young girl who's going to be interacting with this world that's very different than the one that I grew up in, in some ways for the better. And in some ways, we, we shall see. Um, yeah. Like, what are your thoughts on all of that? Oh, God, it's 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 awful. You know, it's I mean, it's interesting. I actually had it written down just jotting notes of how, you know, you were trial by media. And then essentially this new young generation are subjecting themselves to trial by social media mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that's normalized and encouraged. And uh, and it's not going away at all. If anything, it is expedited and just growing and growing and growing, digging its heels in of like, this is how we do things now. Right. And you don't exist unless you're opting into being tried yes. by social media. Yeah. Yes. Where even as a 35 year old, I'm like trying to learn fucking TikTok. I'm oh, like, God. didn't see this turn. I've given up in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mama's just trying to make some stuff happen over here. I've had a lot of life changes lately. <laughs> And, you know, life throws curveballs and sometimes you got to use TikTok to like get back <sighs> in the true. groove of things. But uh, <laughs> no, it's it's really scary. I mean, I I'm, uh, you know, grateful that I wasn't on social media. I you know, I I barely had a, much of a Facebook and I did have a very um you know, self-exploratory <laughs> late teens, early 20s. Like you do. That I've <laughs> been able to keep really private to myself and decide what I want to share with people. And that is, um, it's really unfortunate that that's not how the world works at this point. Um, I'm terrified. I have no idea. I have no idea at all how I'm going to continue to explain, you know, social media to my six-year-olds or anything mm. like that. Uh, I, I easily fall prey to it. I mm. wish I wish that I didn't. But what I think is so interesting, and I, and I know the answer just from listening to you on other interviews, but it sounded like therapy was not a big part of the trajectory of you kind of entering, you know, getting you to this point, which I just have to say is, I, you know, I feel right now in my life, I'm kind of going through this, like, who am I? How did I get here? What's happening? I'm kind of like turning back inward to figure out, you know, to kind of find my feet on the ground again of how I see myself. Mm. And, um, and I think it's just really incredible that at this point in your life, you you know, it seems as if you know yourself hmm. so well. And I think that is what so many people are after when they're, you know, reading self-help books or going on, you know, solo journeys or silent retreats or in therapy is like, I just want to know myself and not doubt myself and not question myself. Do you feel like you've found that sweet spot, even if it doesn't last forever, because that's not how being a human works? You know, you keep growing and, and there's ebbs and flows and the currents change. But do you feel like you're in the sweet spot of just knowing yourself? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've I've talked about um, mental health and therapy um, quite a bit. A lot of people are either like really surprised that I have never like embraced a traditional like talk therapy or EMDR or whatever. A lot of my friends who have been through traumatic experiences have and have found it to be incredibly useful. And I definitely think like if it works for you, it works for you. Um, one of the reasons why it didn't really work for me is because um, I, uh, I encountered some forms of therapists in the prison environment, psychologists and and things like that. And I had bad experiences with them because I just watched them basically prescribe people um, antidepressants that turned them into zombies in the prison environment. And um, that was basically their only 
offer of support and made me very, very distrustful of the profession in general. Not to say that that's what's, you know, happening to there are great therapists out there. I promise this is, was a prison in Italy. But the other <laughs> thing is that um, you, you, you talked about retreats. Um, prison is not a retreat. But what it is, 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 at least for me, it was a place that deprived me of everything but my own mind. And so I spent a very, very long time with nothing to do but to get to know myself and my own mind and to sit uncomfortably with the racing thoughts that go through my mind because I just, I was literally had nothing else that I was allowed or able to do while I was locked in a cell. And some people don't do well with that. Some people can literally go crazy. I was lucky in that I, I, I think worst case scenario, I came out better for that experience. Um, best case scenario is I actually thrived um, due to that proximity to myself, um, which was not like, I will repeat, was not comfortable. Um, a lot of the times I just sat there with thoughts that were going over and over in my head that I couldn't make go away. Like, oh my God, my life is my life this time. Like I'm literally sitting here watching my life be taken away from me. Like this moment right now, taken away from me. And now this moment taken away from me. Like I should like obsessively thinking I should not be here. I should not be here. What am I doing here? But like being present with those extremely painful thoughts made them very familiar to me and made it possible for me when I got out of prison to be able to go to sort of go back into that very familiar, if uncomfortable space of being in my own mind and asking myself questions and talking myself through painful experiences um, as they arose. And I think one of the reasons, again, silver linings, weird things to be grateful for, uh, one of the weird burdens that we put onto victims is we sort of expect them to keep living their lives and being responsible and like paying rent <laughs> and like having a job <laughs> when they're processing the worst experience of their life. And we don't really give people time and space to really reckon with what has happened to them and to learn how to reckon with them. So I don't know, I think I was sort of pushed, I was sort of put in put into, I was thrown into a very, very, I was thrown into an inferno and was told like, figure it out. And I did. And that I'm grateful that I did. I'm lucky. But it sort of taught me how to be my own therapist. And um, which isn't to say that I haven't reached out and read a plenty of books about psychology and even just, you know, those self-help books that ask questions and invite you to journal. Like those are incredibly useful. So yeah, the my mental health journey has been a little bit patchwork um, and scattered, um, but it's worked for me. And I think it's largely because I have not shied away from the pain and the, the things that most bother me. I always look them directly in the eye and try to recognize them for what they are. Do you keep your journals or do you burn them? Oh, I absolutely keep them. 100%. Yeah? Yes, I keep them. Um, not because I ever expect to read them, but maybe one day my my daughter might. I know that like one of the things I wished my mom had done when I was a kid was been more forthcoming with me about what she was like as a teenager. Her her idea was, I don't really want to tell you about all the mistakes that I made as a teenager and young adult because I'm ashamed of them and I don't want you to make the same mistakes. So I'm just going to not tell you what they are. <laughs> and yep. As if yeah. like by telling me <laughs> I would do the exact same thing. Um, whereas my view is I want my my daughter to know that being human is hard and that we're all trying to figure out this problem of being a human all the time, 
no matter how collected we may seem. Like I want to model for her a person who is collected and calm and present, but that doesn't mean that that's how I feel. And it's been a lot of work (laughs) to get to a place like that. And I don't, I'm not even consistent all the time. So I want her to know that it's okay to be imperfect. And I think that's what my journals show is someone who's just really trying to figure out this really difficult thing, which is being a human. Well, I think you're doing a really good job. I do think it's interesting that you found your way into journalism Mm. after (laughs) the interesting (laughs) relationship you've had uh, with journalists in this world. Have you ever encountered someone who was a part of writing stories about you? I have, although not like those fun examples that you might think of, like the Nick Pisas of the world. I have not encountered him, although I think that would be fascinating um, (laughs) at this point. Um, (laughs) Because one of those things I like to say is I don't shy away from talking to anyone. I've I've lived alongside, you know, women who committed Haman's crimes like I can I can talk to anyone, including Nick Pisa. <laughs> so, and he's got his own human lived experience and, and in his own way, he's trying to be his best self. And he is either aware of some of the mistakes he's made or he isn't. He's on his own journey. Who knows? Like, he, that's on him. And I'm not going to be bothered by what journey that he is on. And if anything, I think it might be an interesting encounter, uh, a human encounter, just because I think that a lot of people think that I'm a very angry person, just because I have good reason to be angry, but I'm really (laughs) not. (laughs) I'm not like I get that life is hard and we're all trying our best. And the last thing that I can, the last thing I want to do is to treat people the way that they treated me, which is to assume the worst. So that's kind of a principle that I live by. I have like three principles that I live by, and they really are the guiding principles of my own journalistic endeavors, my own podcast, everything. And that is that one, I should always be curious. I should never approach somebody with a preconceived notion of who they are, or what their take is on anything, what they think, what they what it means to them, what their story is. Always be curious. Always have compassion because everyone like there are very very few psychopaths out there in the world who get up in the morning and think like what evil horrible thing can i do today a lot of people are fumbling their way through life and making mistakes and hurting people along the way and convincing themselves that they're doing the right thing and what it takes to get to that point and the obstacle it is to reckon with that is um is incredible. So I have a lot of compassion for people, especially people who have hurt others, because when you hurt others, you are also hurting yourself. And then having the courage to to stand by those principles, even when um, I face a lot of judgment for doing so. Just going back to talking, you know, giving grace to our younger selves. Again, like I've really just been leaning into, I don't know why 35 just feels really significant. I've mm. had a very significant year so far, but it just feels incredibly significant. So I just assume that it feels like that for everybody else. Maybe it doesn't. But at this point, is there anything, um, not that you would tell your 18 year old self or your younger self, like, this is what's going to happen, or Mm. this is what you're going to go through, but something that you look back and go, wow, you don't even know that you have this inside of you. Mm. But it's, uh, it's there. And it's just this little seedling and it's what's going to get you through. Like, is there something about that girl where you now look back and go, wow, that's very, that's going to get you through a lot in life? Well, one thing that my younger self didn't know um, that is true, but I don't know if she necessarily needed to know it at the time was that she is a lot stronger than she realizes. I think the thing that she needed to know and that I have realized after 15 years of incredibly hard work is that she belongs. She's, she's not, not a part of the human, you know, conglomerate. She's, she's not isolated. She belongs to people because that was one of the hardest things for me was feeling like I didn't belong to anyone anymore. And how much maybe 
even unnecessary pain I went through until I realized that I did belong after all. Like the strength thing, I, we all find our strengths because we're, we're pushed and, and we realize it. The thing that I think would have been most sad is if I didn't realize that I belonged to people. And I think that everyone deserves to feel like they belong to people. That's beautiful. And I'm so happy for you just working it. Mama, like I feel you coming <laughs> through that 2020 uh, pregnant <laughs> pandemic and uh, your podcast Labyrinths that you co-host and produce and have created with your husband, Chris. Um, I also love to do just like a little, you know, end of the podcast cool down with my guests. Sure. It's just five, five little things. It's a thumbs up, something you like, something you know, something you hate, something you love, and a quirky little fact about you. So just okay. uh, something that you like. Something that I like um, is swing dancing. <laughs> Fun fact. <That's> amazing. <laughs> Do you like actively swing dance? Oh, yeah, does yeah. Chris, My does husband your husband and Chris I, swing dance? Yeah, we, we Lindy hop. Um, yeah, we're... We're actually pretty good at it. <laughs> that's amazing. And uh, that see, that's why you need to get on TikTok so you can do some swing dances. Right. That's, that's what the that kids happens. really want to see these days. Yes, it's very trendy on the TikTok <laughs> these days. <laughs> okay, something you know. Um, I know that... Um, I know that... This is kind of a sad thing that I know. I know that there are way more people, innocent people in prison um, for crimes they didn't commit than, um, than goes recognized. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the vast majority of cases in the U.S. are not even tried. They're pled out. And so innocent people are pleading guilty to crimes at terrible rates that are difficult to even quantify because how would you go about it? But the number of innocent people who are in prison for crimes they didn't commit it should worry people just as much as there are unsolved crimes and guilty people who are potentially out there committing crimes now and are not in prison and are not serving time for those crimes. Like we should be just as worried about that number of people. Something that you hate. Hmm. I don't hate a lot of things. That's a hard one. Hate's a really strong Explains. word. I know. I know. <laughs> blue cheese. You know, like hmm. I, I cannot eat something if it's been touched by blue cheese. I <sighs> tried. I, I don't love and, oysters. I'm going to be honest. Okay. I wish I did, but I don't love them. That's how I feel about uni. Mm. I always give uni an extra shot because I'm like, God, I want to be one of those cool people that just like love uni. Yeah. And I don't. I love it's uni. <laughs> I, I fucking love oysters. So there we go. <laughs> we can go to some seafood restaurant and just like really crush the uh, oysters and uni. OK, um, something that you love and not, you know, I know we all love our partners or our children. So just something that you love in life that maybe is not that because we know that comedy is life changing for me. I love comedy, um, especially like just good, well-meaning comedy, like a good Weird Al song just like makes my day. <laughs> see, now I want to see you swing dancing on TikTok to a Weird Al song. And I think that that would be. That's it. That's it. It's my claim perfection. to fame. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, then some quirky fact about you. I, um, I like to sew and I wear, I have a huge costume closet. <laughs> what is your most prized costume? Probably um, the wedding outfits that I made for my husband and I. Um, I sort of, I'm one of those people that upcycles things. So I, I made completely my own like corset thing by hand, everything completely out of nothing. But um, I cobbled together his uh, tuxedo by like turning a, a plain white like suit and made it into this like sci-fi gold suit thing that was awesome i'm very proud of it <laughs> do you guys go to comic cons or anything like um that? well we've never actually gone to comic con together although i would love to do that um the one thing i'm like hesitant about comic con is they tend to be in enclosed spaces with lots of people and i don't love crowds yes. 
I'm actually mm -hmm. very claustrophobic, but um, I love going to a, a, a equivalent version of nerd dumb, which is Ren fairs, because they tend to be outside. <laughs> so love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Um, <laughs> if you are ever in Nashville for a Ren Fair, I will go with you. Um, I probably don't have the outfit, but I will figure it out. I will hook out. you up. I will bring okay, you perfect. an outfit. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a Super Boom podcast hosted by me, Candace King, produced by Melissa D. Mons and Diamond Imprint Productions. Post-production sound by Chris Henry and advertisement partnerships with ACAST. 